say a great way it was a way for us to share code um, and it wasn't it wasn't very good um, there were a lot of problems with pair and, and generally one of the one of the top five bullet points on the code igniter uh, web page was it's not pair so that kind of led to, to some problems that we tried to code around so in the end all the frameworks we had like code igniter I helped make fuel PHP and there's Laravel there's all these different frameworks and people would uh, generally recode the same things in these same frameworks just to work with their one framework. I saw this happen a lot. I actually did it myself quite a lot. Um, I released CodeIgniter OAuth 2, and then I needed the same OAuth 2 logic for Fuel PHP, so I ported it and made Fuel OAuth 2, and then uh, Laravel wanted one, so Taylor copied it and made Laravel OAuth 2, and every single time we found a, a bug or a change in one of them, we'd copy and paste it between all the repos, and then I tried getting Pyro CMS, a uh, uh, CodeIgniter-based CMS that I built, I tried switching that from CodeIgniter to Laravel, and that was a mess as well. So over, over the course of kind of doing all this stuff and doing it very wrong for a while, um, I became very interested in framework interoperable code and making packages that work anywhere. And after quitting all of those various teams for various reasons, um, the only open source project I'm really involved with now is uh, the League of Extraordinary Packages, which aims to make code that you can use anywhere. There's no framework stuff, nothing. Uh, and things like the Framework Interoperability Group, which I actually said correctly for the first time in my life. Um, let's try again. Framework Interoperability Group is done to, uh, makes a lot of standards that helps make that stuff easier. Without the FIG, um, it wouldn't be possible to do a lot of the stuff we're doing today. So, the League of Extraordinary Packages. Um, never in my life have I seen such a strong and varied series of reactions to a bunch of people releasing free code. Um, I'm not sure if you're very familiar with any of the drama, but um, the history of this, uh, of this group, basically I had the idea, because I didn't work with Pyro CMS or Codinator or Fuel, I quit all those teams, I wanted somewhere to put my code, and believe it or not, I'm not so incredibly egotistical that I wanted to release my code under the Sturgeon namespace, um, so I kind of didn't know where to put it. I talked to a few of my friends, uh, Alex Bilby, um, Frank Dijonge over here, and uh, Ben Corlett, an Australian, and uh, we came up with some fairly stupid ideas for a, for a namespace. Um, we originally called the group the PHP Super Best Friends Club, which was great fun. I actually really loved that, but the trouble was coming up with a namespace for that was really hard. We tried SB, FC, and no one could remember it. We tried besties, and it looked ridiculous. Um, <laughs> we did a bunch of stuff, and in the end, I think someone on IRC mentioned, like, the League of Extraordinary Packages. Uh, amongst the drama to come in from that, um, the, only one, the only bit of drama I was expecting was that people would think it was a bit of a dick joke. Um, we're not actually talking about our packages. Um, <laughs> luckily, that's the only one that hasn't come up, so we haven't been in trouble. Uh, we have been called a bunch of elitists for not letting other people contribute code to our namespace. So we allowed other people to contribute code. Then we were called elitists once again for putting quality restrictions on the code that could come in, so we couldn't really win there. Um, we've also been, I've also been called an egotistical jerk who's been stealing the hard work of other people to put it under my own namespace to bolster my own ego, which was aggressively offensive. Um, but we've, we've luckily got a lot of code from a lot of different people, and they've managed to raise their reputations themselves. You'll notice that my name, when I made this, is only on one little place on the website. It's not even there anymore. I've given Fractal to somebody else. But we have loads of code, um, loads and loads and loads of code that does really interesting things. You can't really read this, and you don't need to. This is a screenshot from the phpleague.com. Um, and we've got BooBoo, which is an error handler. We've got some fairly cool CSV stuff, because uh, uh, what is it? F gets CSV is full of quirks and problems. Um, you can use generators to, to loop on through big CSV files, all sorts of cool stuff like that. We've got a lot of OAuth 1 and OAuth 2 stuff, and OmniPay, which is an amazing package that's now managed by Kayla Daniels, um, which you build, kind of similar to Fly System, actually, whoever saw the talk, that Fly System is one of the packages that 
works with uh, multiple cloud ser uh, services in a very abstract way. So you have one single uh, PHP application and you can work with Amazon S3 and Rackspace Cloud Files, all that stuff. OmniPay is very similar. You build one bit of code with one single, um, one single API and it uses the adapter pattern to work with PayPal, Stripe, anything you want. So a lot of this code is incredibly useful. When we first made the package, uh, the, the project, we came up with a couple of rules that would define what we think is extraordinary. No one here is saying that we make the best code in the world, but the point of being extraordinary is that you, you aim to be better than normal. When we started doing it, <laughs> normal in PHP world wasn't particularly awesome. Um, stuff on PHP classes, for example, which is just a, entirely a joke. Um, people copying and pasting zip files from various different websites, SourceForge, all this nonsense. Even some of the early stuff going on uh, Composer and Packagist wasn't particularly ready for, uh, wasn't, like the Ruby community has been using gems for a really long time. Node has had NPM for a really long time. Those communities have worked out how to make really good packages and, and bits of code they can distribute. Um, but PHP is new to that. So we started doing these things um, using PSR2 and a bunch of other rules that I'm gonna go into now. So this talk, that's it about the PHP League itself. And it's just on to good ideas you can do with your packages to make them be popular on the internet. Split into three sections, make, market, and maintain, the three important parts of good open source packages. And there's a bunch of stuff to consider before you get going. Um, some of it's good and some of it's bad, some of it's cautionary tales. Does it exist already is the first thing I think a lot of people ignore. Um, I did a blog post called uh, Attack of the Clones, and um, I should probably not have a sheep. I think it's because you can clone sheep. I should have had a Star Wars thing in there. But um, yeah, if you, if you search for routers or routers on packages, there's 18,000 of them. We don't need 18,000. Um, <laughs> most of them are terrible. A lot of them are incredibly similar. Like it's just a joke to have these so many different things that do the same thing. So before you start building something, work out if it exists. Go on to uh, Google, packages, GitHub, and have a look for similar stuff. Um, if there is a similar stuff, you can build it in a better way. So back to the example of routing, um, Nikita Popov's fast route is a router that came out. It's the 18,000 first router, I guess. Um, and it's much, much, much faster than all of the rest of them. It uses a very unique approach internally to offer a very similar API, and it's very fast. So there are ways to, you shouldn't be afraid of trying to recreate the wheel if you're gonna make the wheel better. We just don't need more wooden wheels right now. Um, so, yeah, if you've got a un unique approach to solving a problem, absolutely share it. Um, you, uh, everyone's got a unique set of skills, and uh, just because something's been working in a certain way for a really long time doesn't mean you have to like use, you have to do it that way. You can do things in new and fun ways. But something very important to remember is do you actually have the time to work on this open source stuff? After 10 years of me being involved with open source projects, I've ended up kind of quitting a lot of it so I can spend more time with my turtle. I've got, you know, I've got things to do, I'm a dad now. But, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, my turtle's so cute. I'm just thinking about my turtle now. But do you have the time? Um, making documentation for this stuff is one of the hardest parts. Even making a good readme or doing anything, it's all incredibly time consuming. Um, writing documentation itself, even writing bad documentation can take you 10 hours. So just making the, the project and whacking it on Reddit is not all you need to do. Um, and if you, what a lot of people do is they like bring it halfway, get it to like 50% done, maybe get a 0.1 version released, and then ask for pull requests. You can't just flop out a piece of half done code and expect everyone to love it and know how it works and want to contribute to it if you haven't put any effort in yourself. Oh, missed one. Oh no, I hate this slide. Stop. Well, I'm not gonna go back. Um, <laughs> so one of them, the, the last slide is about you meeting new people. So it's not all cautionary tales and it's not all complaints. Some of the people you meet are amazing. Um, a lot of people in this room I've, I've met through the open source work, Frank Dejonge, a um, bunch of other people, and I, I consider them very good friends. Um, a lot of good uh, work opportunities have come out of this stuff, um, more conference opportunities. I'm in this country because of open source work. Um, we go around the world and we stay on each other's sofas. Like you meet some amazing friends that will last for life doing open source work, and that's something that is really a benefit. Uh, but the other thing is that you end up, uh, one good thing as well is you end up learning a lot. There's so much stuff you end up learning, just releasing a bit of PHP code, you end up learning all of this. Um, you end up learning about like <laughs> badges, I guess, it's not very important, but semantic versioning, code sniffing, doc blocks, uh, scrutinizer, rebasing code, PSRs, the fig, all this stuff. You learn so much stuff that you might not have learned trying to get your code up to a high quality. 
So to quickly go through making stuff, um, <laughs> a lot of the time people just kind of make a little bit of code and then bang it on Reddit and think that's the end of it. Um, and they just end up getting ripped apart. Now that's not necessarily entirely the fault of the person putting it on Reddit, apart from they shouldn't have put it on Reddit. Um, Reddit is a very hostile place, but they do come up with some, some good feedback sometimes um, <laughs> amongst the sea of screaming at you. Um, what a lot of people unfortunately do is they, like I said, they, they kind of do a bit of code. You often see initial commit one hour ago and then it's all over the internet. I, there's no need to pu publish your code that quickly. Also, the, the quality of PHP code has come an incredibly long way in the last three years. So something that would have been okay three years ago is not okay anymore. Um, if you start publishing stuff with singletons and just you know crap code or it's like PHP 5.1 style, then you are going to get ripped apart. And whilst getting ripped apart shouldn't be the, the, like, the litmus test for how much you uh, care about your work, um, it's a shame to let good ideas and good quality code die just because you didn't do PSL1 or something like that. So the first step is to design an API that your developers will want to use. Um, there's a lot of code around, yeah, by this I'm not talking about HTTP APIs or REST, I'm talking about the functions and methods and class names that people have to work with. Um, your API, your code might be amazing, but if your API is very complicated, people won't use it. This is the same reason that a lot of people use CodeIgniter over something like Symfony. Um, Symfony is, is incredibly good quality code and it does a lot, but the APIs can be very verbose, and people that are just getting into programming don't want to do that. So CodeIgniter would ignore all quality standards, all coding styles, ignored everything, and shoved everything in one massive class with 100 line methods, just because they could call one line of code and then one method, and it would be really easy to do. This is an example of an overly verbose API. Um, who knows what this is doing? Oh, it says sending an email right at the top. Bit of a hint. Really prepared with this talk. Uh, what this is doing here is we are creating a transport layer using SMTP. That's really cool. It's very flexible. I can do stuff with it. I'm setting a username and a password, so I've got it stored in plain text, obviously. Um, sending a message. But first, I have to instantiate the instance. We're not using a constructor, because why would you do that if you could just make a factory? Uh, we are setting different things on each line, and then eventually we're actually firing that email off through the SMTP transport layer, and the job is done. That's, that's, that's fair enough, I suppose. It sends an email, but you could just do that. That's how Laravel does it. It's a bit easier, right? Um, part of an API is naming stuff right. Who here has noticed the probably age-old trend, but very recently I've seen a lot of them, where you come up with a theme and then everything has to be named after the hilarious joking theme. Um, we were kind of, uh, Frank was on the core team of Fuel PHP as well. We, we thought it was pretty funny at the time. We had Fuel, so the command line utility was oil. And then we had a package installation called the oil refinery. And it was, oh, it's so hilarious. Oil sells. Oh, it's all, oh, God. No one knew what it did. No one had a clue what they, like, oil refined this thing and it, <laughs> fracking something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it was, seemed very clever at the time, but it's really not very useful. And, and lots of uh, projects still do this. So looking at this code example, whoops, is an error handler. They kind of stopped working on it, so use boo boo by the league is better. Um, but right here, right here, we're instantiating a run, which is part of the whoops. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Um, and then we're assigning it to a whoops variable, so we have no more information on what we're actually doing. Then we're pushing a handler in, cool, a handler, I don't know what, what we're handling, but we're, it's a pretty one. Um, and then we're registering that pretty handler thing to our whoops run, so I don't know what this code is doing at all. It makes zero sense. Um, this could be a, a slightly better API. Um, we are instantiating an error handler. So, okay, now I can uh, infer that whoops is to do with, um, with error handling at least. Uh, and I'm pushing, I'm pushing that into the handler. Something better even still, instead of naming it whoops, because we're not actually, it's not an instance of whoops. It's an instance of the handler, right? Um, so we can make an instance of an error handler and then push things in and then register it, right? Your code samples need to be fairly clear what's actually happening. Something else very important with, um, with making an API is to have a very clear focus on what you're doing. Now this happens at a few levels. You wanna have a clear focus on what each class and, and method are doing, um, but you also wanna have a clear focus on what your package is doing. Just because you start building one package and then you realize your package does two or three things doesn't mean that your package has to do those two or three things. If, if some of the functionality would be better split off, totally split it off. What I often find is that while I'm working on a package through the development levels, I end up finding some functionality that I, I need to do. 
I'll keep it all kind of bundled together in one mega package while I'm working on it, and then when I get to version 1.0, um, I can then split it off. It can be a bit of a pain to have multiple dependencies that you're developing at the same time um, whilst it's changing quickly, but when you get to version 1, then your API should start to slow down a little bit. And if you find a package that does, so if you're worried about the, the two or three things you're doing and you find a package that does one of those things, just use that package. It's totally fine to refer on dependencies, as long as you don't require dev master like a jerk. Utilize common design patterns, something that Code and I never did, just flagrantly ignored them. Um, they don't like using singletons much these days, so that's probably a bad idea. Um, avoid overuse of static. Even if you have like static and, and instantiated ways to, to work with things and you put a single static example in your readme, people will freak the fuck out about you using statics. Like, ah, it's all static, what is this, the 90s? Like, they freak out and it doesn't make any sense because statics is fairly recently, but they still complain that it's old. Uh, breaking apart large classes is part of the same, you know, strict focus. Don't have one class that does 12 different things. And uh, make your code framework agnostic. This is something I've been harping on about for the longest time. Um, I got screamed at by most of the Laravel community by pointing out that if your code doesn't need to be tied to Laravel, maybe don't tie it to Laravel. Apparently that was a crazy, insane thing to say. Um, <laughs> death threats over that one. Uh, you don't need to rely on a framework. If there's like one or two methods, like Illuminate Support has a few helpful handler um, array kind of functions, like array get and things like that. If you need one or two functions or methods from a framework, then you can copy and paste those into your own class and then say, thanks, Taylor Rockwell, this is a great function. I found it from here, right? You can attribute code and take it. It's totally okay as long as you respect the license. Which version of PHP should I support? Now, I, there's a few different approaches to this. There's one approach which is, I would like to support the largest number of versions of PHP possible so that I can have as many people use it as possible. The other approach is, I would like to support the highest version reasonably possible to try and force people to upgrade and then it's more responsible and everything else. You have to depend, you have to decide what you want to do based on the project. If you have lots of paying clients that are very aware of security but they happen to be tied to an old version of PHP, then you can totally make it work for, for those versions of PHP. Um, it's probably not worth bothering with 5.3 anymore, um, but again, do what you need to do. If you're requiring a higher version of PHP simply so that you can use, like this is a kind of an older example, but if you, if you bumped your code from 5.3 to 5.4 just so you could use a very short syntax, you're being a jerk, right? Do it for useful reasons. And eventually you start to hit things like with, if you could use generators instead of something else, maybe that's a performance thing, uh, thing. So maybe upgrading will help make your package quicker. But often you can do it an old way and a new way and just have a different method for it or add some backwards compatibility. But really think about it, it's important. Put your code on source, uh, put your source code on GitHub. Speaking like Yoda today, who uses Bitbucket? Stop. Um, do you use Bitbucket for your private code because you get unlimited free versions? Yeah, that's fine, I do the same thing. Um, when, it's <laughs> when it's public, do you use Bitbucket? I thought not. Um, <laughs> code Igniter, hilariously, I spent like years berating them saying, please put your code on source control. We want to we want to send in patches that are not through like the forums. And um, eventually they said, all right, fine, Phil, fine. We'll put our source code on the internet. We'll put it on Bitbucket. Three pull requests in the first month. Um, about a year of that, we got to like 10 pull requests and most of them didn't work very well because no one knew how Mercurial worked. Um, now they support Git, uh, Git as well, great. But the second we put Code Igniter onto um, GitHub, we had about a thousand pull requests in the first couple of months, and it's just better, just use it. And Google Code is deprecated, and SourceForge installs viruses on your computer when you download software, so maybe don't put it on that. Who writes tests? Who has written a test? <laughs> okay, there's a few more hands going up. Um, <laughs> do you, who doesn't know what tests are? No. Um, Tests are incredibly useful, and when you're building really small, uh, small packages that do a very like specific thing, tests are actually is much easier to make your code work by building tests than it is to try and find some way to shim that into a, a, a browser package so you can keep on refreshing the page to see if it works. Um, when you're building a package, you usually have it in a separate folder, and that's usually not part of an application. It's just there. It's source slash fractal, and you've just got that little thing, and it doesn't run, and there's no web server, and there's no nothing. Um, so it's actually easier to write tests. Uh, and you want to make sure that your tests are automated. 
If you're not automating your tests, then they might as well not exist. And the number of times I've kind of been on, there on a Friday, I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure that thing works. Push it, fucking breaks. Um, if they're not, if you haven't got Travis CI set up, then your code won't work. <laughs> uh, and with tests and using uh, GitHub, Everyone knows this, I'm sure, but you can have Travis set up to, to look at pull requests. So whenever someone sends in code, it will run those tests to make sure the code actually works before you merge it in. Package needs to be on Packagist. Uh, no one puts their stuff on Pair anymore. Literally no one. Sebastian Berg Bergman has left. Um, the, whole, the whole community got the crap off of Pair, so just put it on there, it's easy. And putting it on Packagist is literally a case of, this is actually an overly verbose composer, Jason. Um, you just want to make a name, a description, uh, a license, anything. Put the DBAD license in there if you know what that one is, that's fun. Uh, link to your homepage, otherwise it points to GitHub, which ain't great. Uh, an array, that's important, of, uh, of you and your name. And you might want to make like a spammy GitHub app, Phil Sturgeon, just so you don't get too much spam, but I've been getting it for years. Then you can use PSR4 autoloading. Who uses PSR4? Ah, eh, PSR0? Oh, never mind. <laughs> Upgrade, it's better. And uh, this is the old website. How grateful is everyone that they've upgraded? <laughs> it looks so much better. Um, by having it on Packagist, you can just tag new releases. You can use a little change log like that, and it will put it on Packagist. You can do this. This will happily save the polar bears from going extinct and having to run out of ice to stand on. This will reduce the amount of uh, data being sent around the internet. By listing, the number of, uh, by listing these attributes in your... Uh, in your git attributes file, when the git repository is exported to an archive, it will not put those files in there. So when people install things via Composer, they don't want your tests, they don't want all the arbitrary data that you have in there, it just, they just want the basic files. If they want to contribute changes back, they can clone the repo somewhere else via git, and then they'll get all that stuff in there. But that keeps it out of zip files. Semantic versioning, everyone? Yeah? Do this. Um, it means that people know from looking at your version numbers what might have changed. The first number, so if you have uh, version one, two, three, then version number one is breaking changes, version number two is new features, and the, the part three is bug fixes. So that means if I upgrade, um, I can require version 1.2 star, or use the tilde, whatever. And that means that if it goes to one, two, four, I know that it's only bug fixes, and that's fine, I can totally upgrade. If it's one, 1.3, we've jumped from two to three on that second number, then I know there's some fun new stuff for me to use, but it will still work in the same way. And then if you break stuff, so you break the API, uh, you remove a function, or remove a class, rename something, that needs to be a new version because people cannot upgrade to that without breaking. Coding standards. Who uses PSR2? Who hates the fig for making them stop using tabs? <laughs> okay, please don't wait for me outside. I'm not a fire. Um, coding standards are very important, and PSR2, whether you like it or not, is kind of the way of the PHP community. Uh, even Laravel, that was the last stand against PSR2, they've totally implemented PSR2 now. Uh, people just expect it, and it's easier. Uh, IDEs for PHP come with PSR2 enabled. You can just click a button, and the code will all look the same, and you won't conflict on new lines because there's brackets in different places. It's just easier. Doc blocks, really boring. Moving on. Continuous integration, talked about it. Travis, do it. Have a license. Uh, having a license is really helpful. We had a case for the league where somebody contributed a bunch of code to the league, and then they sent some other massive pull request afterwards with a bunch of stuff that we didn't really like. So we asked him to, take, to change a few of those bits, and then they got really angry and tried to send another pull request to take their code back. Um, and then they got in touch with us with a lawyer saying that he was going to sue us. And we looked the lawyer up, and he was some military lawyer that dealt with people going AWOL from the army. I had no idea what was going on. And I was like, bring your lawyer. I don't care. We've got a license. We're backed up. Um, I would love to laugh you out of court, you dick. Uh, having a license is important, and um, it's just really easy. Use MIT or something. It's, it's just simple. Contributor instructions. Contributing.md is a markdown file you can put in your root. And then when people go to send a pull request, GitHub will say, hey, have you read the contributing guide? Which is a bunch of kind of nerd-orientated instructions that will help people 
clone your repo, run the tests, because maybe it's not PHP unit, maybe it's PHP spec. It will help them work out which branch they should send things to. So do you want to send things to master or develop? Where do they go? All of that stuff, all your coding standards, mention use PSR2. Or maybe you just use PSR1, so some Muppet doesn't start putting uh, spaces in with your tabs, right? Mention what you use. And if that seems like a whole list of eat your greens, it totally is, that's the point. Eat your vegetables before you have dessert. This website, phppackagechecklist.com, was made by the same chap that designed the PHP League, who designed this website, and who designed these slides that I stole. And it's a great list of the same things that I've just discussed. You can go through and click the things that you've done. There's links to more information on other things, and it will get you going. Marketing, a little bit shorter than that first section. Choosing a good name is very important. Once again, search around the internet and find it. Um, Short and sweet is pretty good. Long names get confusing, and if you have to type it out a bunch of times, you hit the 120 character list uh, limit on your IDE before you've even imported a package. Uh, this is really hard to say without sounding offensive, but some countries you have names that are really complicated for a lot of the rest of the world to spell. Um, <laughs> just gonna pick on Russians. Um, it can occasionally be quite difficult to remember how to spell like Z, X, Y, R, something with an upside down, like that's hard. Maybe pick a nickname if you have a name that anyone else might struggle with spelling, right? Or use something like the league. <laughs> that's another one. People forget how to spell Rhine Inc. It happens to everyone. Um, the documentation is very important. There's a bunch of myths about documentation. People think it's kind of an option. People think you can say read the code. People think all sorts of stuff. Myth number one, unicorn. The read the code is an acceptable answer for where are the docs. Not true. Uh, if It's just not true. <laughs> I don't want to send people to the documentation to try and work it out. Myth number two, it's Loch Ness. That is apparently a very large sturgeon, is the theory on what the Loch Ness is. Uh, Auto-generated docs are good enough. No, they're not. Auto-generated docs are basically telling someone to look at the code, but it's on a website instead of in the, in the IDE. It's the same thing. I don't want to know what method is what and who with the arguments. I want to know how to use the app, the package. Docu uh, documentation myth number three, guy on fire. Uh, all you need is a readme file. I think that's actually Bigfoot. All you need is a readme file. This is better than simply pointing them at the, uh, the code, but it's not entirely all you need. It's usually a very good way of having some simple kind of, this is a quick example, but it's great to use while you're developing it as well. You can build things up, and as your code gets bigger and more full, you can grow the README example and use that list of README usage guide stuff uh, as an example, as, as a basis for your actual documentation. But by the time you hit version one, have some documentation. Uh, number four, it's easy. It's really not. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, it can take a long time to do, like I said, 10 hours. Uh, even after doing 10 hours worth of work, people will still be like, why doesn't it explain this thing that I, you didn't think about actually <laughs> doing? Like I've had people try and use my code in ways I didn't think you could even use it, and then they complain I didn't document it. Like, well, you just invented that use case, that's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> but it's good. Um, having documentation means that you can just like point at people and be like, read the freaking docs, and it, it does help. Uh, and these are the must-haves for good documentation. The elevator speech. Explain it like I'm five. Explain it really simply. We've had so many people uh, contribute packages to the league, and they're like, this package will help you abstract your adapter handlers to use more management buses than the last example that's built in Ruby. Like, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so explain it like I'm five, and maybe we'll let you in the group, but other people will then know what you're talking about. Talk about what the package is and why it matters. If there are similar, uh, similar projects, put that in an example underneath and explain why it's different. Don't just put, like, this is a port of Ruby X, because if I'm trying to learn how a PHP package works, I don't want to go and have to learn how a Ruby package works. Simple example, underneath the README. So explain it with words, and then for people that aren't, uh, aren't English language as a first speaker, explain it with code. That always helps. Put some installation instructions in. Just show them composer, require, then the name of the package. Don't tell them to edit their composer JSON. It's not 2011. That, that's all you've got to do. That and install the latest version. Real handy. Keep a change log. There's a website called keepachangelog.com. Really good. Use that. Link to where they can find the code from your docs. Because they might actually want to go look at the code. It shouldn't be the first thing they go and look at, but they should want to look at it. And then put some badges in. Don't go nuts, but you know, have a few. They're pretty. And then make a nice looking website. Helps with branding. All of the all of the league websites look a bit like this, right? 
and uh, they've all got the same kind of layout as everything else have. An introduction with some points of what it's about, the elevator speech, some uh, <laughs> elevator speech, and uh, sections and then different pages on different topics. So, come on, you can do it. There we go. Most documentation websites look the same. Vagrant, Stripe, Bourbon. Less Laravel's old one, other stuff, Ember. It all looks the same. So, don't know what that one's about. Um, tell people about your code. Here are some great places you can put your code. Reddit, Arr, blocked it on my host file, but maybe you'll have better luck. Twitter, hack and use. I regret putting that in there, don't do it. SitePoint is a great place. You can often talk to uh, Bitfalls on Twitter and just say, hey, I've got this great new package. I'd like to write a blog about it. Here's an example, and then they'll pay you money to write about it. And then you get a bunch of uh, free marketing for your, uh, for your package. PHPWeekly.com, you could submit your blog to them, and then maybe they'll you know, read about your blog posts. And PHPDeveloper.org is roughly the same. Okay, maintaining. Speeding up. Uh, it's good to watch your code spread around the rest of the internet, right? Uh, a great way of doing that is to actually look at how people are using it on GitHub. This is something that I found really interesting and hadn't considered doing before for a while. And I found that people were using Fractal in ways that I had no idea you could use it. And it was great because sometimes they were just actually crazy people. But, and sometimes they hadn't read the docs, bless them. But sometimes they, they invented potentially new features. Whenever I saw someone bending over backwards to do something that actually seemed like a legitimate use case, I just made a convenience method or like recoded some stuff to make it work better. So it's really good to see how people actually use your code in the wild. Have a look for it on Google Analytics. See where, see where it's coming from. I had a few people write blogs being like, Fractal can't do this thing. And I'm like, it totally can. You're just doing it wrong. And they're like, oh, OK. And they updated the blog post. So the public reputation of my, of my package was improved because I kept an eye on what people were saying about it. it. Seems a little bit like arguing on the internet, but when it's that, it's not so bad. Twitter is a good place to look. Um, people often link to it. If you uh, yeah, keep the same hashtag as like in your URL or whatever, then uh, it's quite easy to find it. Issues and pull requests aren't a source of fun for anyone, but uh, it's very important to, to keep up with issues as they come in. If someone sends a pull request and it lasts about a month before you merge it, it's going to conflict. You're going to say, can you update it? They're going to say no. <laughs> um, just keep them, keep them up to date. Dealing with strong personalities is difficult. Uh, there's a fair few people on the internet that think I'm a bit of an ass, but I've met some absolute, <laughs> absolute stunners uh, on, on, the, on the internet. And most people are pretty nice, but you occasionally get some people that are incredibly rude. And not just to you, but to other people on your package. You find people that like your code so much that when someone else posts for help, they just start screaming at them. Um, I've had people send in pull requests, and they've never sent a pull request before. There's two options here. Be like, hey, there's a couple of problems here. Could you go and check the contributing guide and maybe have a little fix? That won't really work. That's a security hole. Please work on this, and I'll be happy to merge it. Or, noob! <laughs> Um, don't be pushed around. If people are being jerks, just be like, well, take your code somewhere else, mate. That's what we did with that crazy military lawyer hiring Muppet, and he went off and made some other fork that no one uses. That was fine. Uh, <laughs> I'd much rather like have some. I'd much rather have to write a bit more code myself than be uh, feel obliged to continue working with someone who's being a complete Muppet. Listen to those that are using it. There's a few large projects in PHP that have a bit of a habit of because they're very popular. They have a lot of people agreeing with whatever they say. When somebody else says, actually, I think this might be a problem, um, they just say, no, 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 no. I've got 10,000 people using this software. Of course it's not a problem. If that person's using your software and they say it's a problem, it might actually be a problem. Give them time of day. Listen to their concerns. And don't be defensive about it. If someone says, hey, I've got this feedback for your project, you should be like, all right, put my ego aside. What did I mess up? Let's sort this out. Um, instead of just being like, ah, I'm the best. Get out of here. It's, it's not helpful. Uh, backwards compatibility is the hardest part of any open source project. It's really a problem. Um, things like Kohana, 
maintained version 2 and version 3 because they just recoded it so hard that people didn't want to change. Then they've got two active projects. They've got two entirely separate websites, two entirely separate communities, and everything's separate. You have like different versions of packages. It's madness. So you want to find a thin line uh, between recoding everything so hard that people get fed up and, and stick on the old version and not changing anything at all. That was the death of Coding Native because for five years they changed 10 lines of code or something. Um, it's, it's really hard to find a middle ground, and it depends on your, on your package. Uh, try and alias stuff as much as you can, so try and put a bit of work into uh, maintaining backwards compatibility on a major version. Um, it can be a bit of a pain, but it can be worth using. If five people use your, your project, maybe don't bother. Um, and you can always bump a major version and then maintain the old version for a little bit and put in like some patches for a little while and then say, you're on your own now, sorry about that. Six months is a reasonable time to merge little things. But if, if you decide that you want to get going and you're done with your project, you want to quit, I did this with Fractal, I, I looked to the contributors list. I had to give it to somebody because I didn't want to, uh, didn't want to get rid of it. Getting rid of code and just, and just leaving it sat there and not telling anyone that you stopped working on it is incredibly rude and disrespectful to the people that use your code. It's also potentially dangerous. If people are using this code thinking it's up to date and there's a massive bug in there, then you've just screwed over a whole bunch of people. So look to the contributors and see if somebody is willing and ready to take it over. And able is very important. Willing, and, uh, willing is not enough. They have to be able to look after it. Um, this is a, a huge benefit of the PHP League is that because we have a shared namespace, we can swap uh, project leads out at a moment's notice. We can change them every day if we want, and it never affects your code. If you have it under your personal namespace, then you have to then like, give it to somebody else, and people have to update their references, update the namespace potentially. It's a real pain in the backside. Uh, another benefit of the league in this sort of stuff is that we've really limited our bus factor. Uh, there's been a fair few people that only have one person on the project, and nobody else has access and no one has access on GitHub or Packagist, and if that person goes missing or has a loss in the family, which has happened a few times with large projects, um, somebody's, uh, somebody's wife got cancer and they just weren't able to work for a while, um, and, and no one could get updates for this, and there were security issues, and it's, it's a hard situation to be in, but if he was to have given somebody else access to GitHub and Packagist, they could have taken over while he went through his hard time. And on that awfully morbid note, um, <laughs> let's see if I can pick that back up. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I got nothing. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to end it quite on that note. Uh, <laughs> people die. Give your code to someone else. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, that is a QR code because apparently that's a thing. And uh, you can rate this talk on Joined In. Um, please forgive me for the ending. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions.